but you are good, you've been so good, Lord, you are good, you've been better than good, I can't praise you enough, I owe you my life, can't praise you enough, even if I try, cause you've been been so good. Oh, you've been, yes, you have. You've been so good. Yeah, you've been, you've been so good to me. Oh, to me, yeah. Oh, Lord, you've been so good. Lord, you've been so good. Good morning. So grateful I get to be with you before service rolls on. Today we celebrate nine years God has blessed us to be a congregation, the tabernacle, his doing, wasn't on the radar, and yet I'm grateful that he put it on the radar so that we could grow together in him. I think it's fitting on this ninth church anniversary that we commune together to remember who our Savior is and what he has done for us. And so I know some of you are going, man, we've had communion two Sundays in a row. The Bible says as often as you do this, you do show you hear forth his remembrance, his coming back again. And so, I, again, what better day to do it than on the day that he allowed us to become a congregation, putting him at the center, Christ-centered church, celebrating what he's done for us through the shedding of his blood. So I'm going to give you time. If you would, go ahead, find cracker, bread, water, juice. And if you were checking your phone over the weekend, you got a text saying we were going to have communion today for our church anniversary. So it becomes now who read their messages on their phone? Did you skip over the message? Did you skip over what God had to say? No, I'm joking. I'm teasing. But seriously, let us do this together. So let's, as, let's do it as a church family, as a body of believers. Let us come together and let us celebrate communion. So again, bread, biscuit, toast, cracker. Let's get it in hand, water, juice. All right, give you a little bit more time. And again, as you're searching for it, I love what Paul recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 
The Corinthians had an issue with being self-serving and selfish. They sh did not want to share. And one of those areas they did not want to share was in the area of food with others who didn't have food. And so Paul calls them out on it. And as he calls them out on it, he begins to talk about what it means to share and commune together. And he begins to talk about the night that Jesus was portrayed and how important it is for us to do this together and to be, come to God and confess our burdens and our sins before we do it. Because many, he said, have, sleep, have slept, many have lost their lives because they came to God. In this moment, he was describing full of pride and selfishness. Now, some of us, I don't say that this morning to spook you out. I say that this morning to say that it's good for us to first, before we partake in communion, to confess our sins one to another. So once we do that, it, it allows God to, if you will, cleanse us, like that Old Testament language, cleanse and purify us and consecrate us to be able to commune with God and with one another. So, all right. If you have it, we're going to pray this morning first. We're going to pray over this, and then we're going to take communion together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for providing these elements. God, may the bread that we have represent your body, which is broken for us, and may the water and juice that we have represent your blood that was shed for us to wash away our sins. And God, may we take this moment of time seriously. Lord, we confess our sins to you sins, Lord, of pride, selfishness, ego, Lord, of distrust of you. We confess it now that we may have this sweet communion with you and with one another, even in this virtual setup. We ask all of this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. As we highlight and celebrate it Easter weekend last Sunday, we talked about in the message to Passover which becomes the Lord's Supper. And then that moment and that night when the Passover became the Lord's Supper, the disciples were in the upper room with Jesus and he was telling them and trying to yet again prepare them for all that was to come. And so he had bread and they were all sitting around the table and he blessed the bread and he broke it and he said to them, take, eat, for this is my body which will be broken for you. Let us take the bread that we have today and eat it together in remembrance of his body being broken for us. After he gave them the bread, he then took the cup and he prayed over the cup and he said, take this cup and drink all of this for this cup and this wine in this cup represents my blood which will be shed for you for the remission of your sins but I won't drink it new with you until we're all together in my father's kingdom. And he took the cup and passed it and they all did drink. Let us all drink together. Now we don't have a place to fellowship and, and congregate together this morning. Man, I missed that listening to the chatter and the talking and everything that we would do pre COVID in this building and I look forward to the day when we get to get together again and high five each other from a distance because we'll still be doing social distancing. But I'm looking forward to the day when we get to do this together in person. Since we can't though, let's do the next best thing. Since we've got technology God has blessed us with and we can join in from anywhere, text in the comments, good morning. Say happy church anniversary. Type in somebody's name and connect with them this morning that you haven't connected with in a while. Tell them it's good to see them online. Wake somebody up and say, hey, are you watching this church anniversary? And let's fellowship in that way. And as you do that, keep the comments coming. Let's get ready for worship to start, and I'll see you soon.
Good morning. It's so good to be with you on this Sunday, the Sunday we have set aside to celebrate nine years that God has blessed us to come together as a church. In the message, I'll get into a little bit more vision casting and church history, if you will. We'll also soon be having a Discovery the Tab where we get into a little bit more of that conversation as well. Sufficient to say, I want to share with you this morning, I am grateful for all that God is doing. As you can see, I'm in the auditorium of the hub, and soon we'll be able to use this space. We'll, you'll see some pictures, but behind me is the sound system speakers going in, projector screen, and the lighting, the can lighting is up. So, you know, I'm, I'm getting excited as we get closer, like anything when you're building or renovating, the little things come out towards the end but that lets you know that you are towards the end. I want to say to somebody this morning, there is light at the end of the tunnel if you just keep moving forward, which is our church theme. What makes me most excited and humbled today is this started nine years ago with a small group of people, four families, um, eight adults, eight children, and today you look at nine years later and we have the privilege of serving the Jeff Vandalooville, Greaterville neighborhoods, having people being able to walk to church as well as people driving in, as well as other people coming from other parts of the city. And I'm grateful because God has done all of this. It hasn't always been easy. It hasn't always been uh, what I would call even fun, just to be honest. However, God has blessed our church immensely and shown us that God is too big to be put in any box or any building. I don't care what the building is. So a couple of quick announcements that I want to share with you coming up. We are continuing in Joshua Online Bible Study. You see those details. Join us. I'm telling you, it is worth the time and worth the investment. You'll be glad that you did. And then on the other side of that, we're starting a new series next Sunday called The Conquest. We dealt with the crossover, and now we're going to head to the conquest where we see God walk Joshua and the Israelites through obtaining now and possessing the promised land. I won't get into many details now, but I would just tell you that there's faith in possessing, there's following in possessing, and there's fighting. 
Now, I know some of y'all got happy when I said fight, because you, you live, you live for it. Where is that? Show it to me, that whole wish factor. I'm not necessarily talking about a physical fight, but I am talking about spiritual warfare and trusting God and knowing that he is the ultimate warrior, that he fights on behalf of his people. So I'm excited about getting into that series. And then lastly, I'm, I want to share something with you briefly. In this month of April on the nonprofit side, we have this Tabernacle Community Development Challenge. We want to ask you to share this with friends and family. Here's how it works. We're asking individuals to give $25. That's it, $25. You can spend $25 uh, in a blink when y'all click on Amazon or when you go to some of these other sites that I've learned that come up like if you got Instagram. And so rather than send the Amazon man to your house this month, send $25 to Tabernacle CDC. The website is all coming across the screen, www.tabdev.org. That's www.tabdev.org. And then we're going to ask you to share with friends and family and challenge five of them to do this. What we're looking to do is we're coming down the pipeline. We want to close out this hub project and roll into a new project this summer that we'll get into more later this morning. And we need everybody's help to pitch in with this. So if you've never given, that's okay. There's a first time for everything. Let this be maybe the first time you join in. And some of you may say, well, that I can't do 25, but I can do 15. Great, I can do 10. Whatever you can do, but we're aiming for that 25 and then asking five more individuals because there's something about when you challenge one another that sparks an energy. And the beauty of it is the gifts will be matched. We have uh, been blessed with an organization that will match gifts up to a certain dollar amount. And so we're excited about that. So let the challenge begin. Speaking of challenges, my last update announcement I want to bring to you is the biggest loser is still going. And let me tell you, it is highly competitive. I believe we're down to like 13 people and they're not letting off the throttle at all. I'm behind, so I got to catch up. I want them to know that they ain't going to beat me. They might, they might think I'm down, but let me tell you, I'm not out because I got God on my side. You see how I got real spiritual real quick? But seriously, it's been a blessing, and we're setting up some things to start bringing in some speakers to talk about mental health, emotional health, and physical health. So that's what I got this morning. As we get ready to worship, I want you to take a moment and hear from a few voices and hear from just a few people in their own way what the tab means to them on this ninth church anniversary. God bless. The tab, the tab is family to me. Like I love the tabernacle. The tabernacle is family, is unity, um, is camaraderie, and I just I love the the spirit here. It, it is it is everything to me. I love the tab. The tab is a place where I can be myself, flaws and all, silliness and all. It happens all here, it goes all down. I love the people here. I love the congregation here because like I said, I can totally be myself and they love me unconditionally. The Lord called me to this congregation um, and I am so glad that my family and I made the decision to be a part of the tabernacle because it's a place where you can feel love, you can feel freedom. And the pastor and first lady are just amazing people. And there's, I, I just can't say enough about them. Their family has helped my family so much. I don't know where we would be without the tab, without the, the people here and without the love that people give us. We love you tab. What the tab means to me is family. Um, I've been a part of the Tab family since the beginning. Um, I, I love my pastor. I love my first lady. I love the, the entire Tab family. Um, they have always been there for me whenever I call, whenever I text, to pray for me, to talk with me. So for me, the Tab means family. <laughs> the Tabernacle. The Tabernacle is home, <laughs> okay? It's home, not just because my children are here, but because I know that the spirit of the Lord is here. 
and the family and community all around us. We, we generate energy. All the Tab family, good morning Tab family, all of us, generating energy and love from the top to the bottom. As Soon as you walk in the door, you're gonna feel love because the tabernacle demonstrates what God gives us, love. Okay, so what the Tab means to me, and I know it might be a cliche to say, but community, because um, the tab is known to congregate together a lot, which is what we do as a church naturally, but I feel like we do it especially well. So that's one thing I can think of for the tab is community. So it's hard to believe that we are nine years in this thing, Tabernacle family. I am so excited and so honored to serve and humbled to be your first lady. I remember um, when the Lord continue to pour up on the vision uh, of the tabernacle to Pastor Dre. And I remember uh, morning after night and morning after night where he was praying and writing out everything that the God, God would give him about the tabernacle. And, and he kept saying the unchurched, the unchurched. And I never knew what that meant, but you guys remember kind of our first and second year, he would talk to us about God calling us to the unchurched. And then one Sunday morning, I got it. You guys remember how things were for us as new uh, praise and worship leaders. We were all just shaking in our boots and we would say things like, lift your hands, lift your hands, everybody. And we would say it kind of forcefully, right? And I remember praying, saying, Lord, why aren't they lifting their hands? And God reminded me, Tiffany, you remember unchurched, right? You remember unchurched. And I said, yes, Lord, I remember. He said, remember, you too have to be unchurched. And I got it at that point. God wasn't just calling us to the unchurched. He was also calling us to be unchurched because we had to forget some of that ritualistic religious stuff that we had brought into the tabernacle. He was calling us to do a new thing and to be a new thing in the kingdom. So that's what the tabernacle means to me. It means the newness of Christ. It means kingdom building in a fresh new way. And I am so excited for the nine years that we have committed to Christ. And I can't wait to see the 90 more to come. So here's to it, Tabernacle. Let's go.
coming to you with the word today. Our worship ministry, music ministry blessed me this morning. He has done great things. I don't know if you recognize it or not, whether you've been around for a few weeks, a few years, or at the very beginning of the tabernacle. Through the highs and lows and everything in between, God has done great things and continues to do great things in our church. So let us celebrate him today. Not to mention the person singing that song, leading it. She kind of special. I mean, I'm grateful. God has blessed me tremendously with my wife, Lady Tiffany. If you don't mind this morning, just say God bless to her. Say hello to her. Yes, I'm calling it out. Normally, it's not something I do. But when I look at today, a huge reason why I get to do what I do is because she is who she is. So help me celebrate and thank her this morning for being who she is in Jesus Christ. Thank you for blessing me, God, with a wonderful wife. Thank you. I also want to say to my children, Kendall and Ahmad, again, I am who I am because of who they are and all that they do in helping serve our king and helping serve in the tabernacle. I'm excited to get into this word this morning. This word is a mixture of vision, church history, and dealing with where we are as we continue talking about the book of Joshua. So I'm going to ask you to stay with me this morning. Take notes. Um, if you haven't already, share the link, this message this morning. Share it with somebody. Or if they're not social media um, savvy or do not engage in social media, whether it's you know, YouTube or Facebook, then let them know. They can go out on their Amazon Fire Stick or uh, our um, Roku channel and view the message at any given time. Yes, God has blessed us in that way. So let's get into the word. Joshua chapter 5. Go there if you will. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. And again, today will not be like a traditional message. But we do want to go here. Joshua chapter 5, starting at verse 13. When you have it this morning, say amen. I'm rocking my tabernacle shirt. I'm excited. I am excited. Glory to God. As I look around, and as you're getting there, as I look around and can remember so many things that have happened in this space where I'm standing, and then just thinking about what's to come. Doesn't come without opposition, but I'm grateful because in opposition, it's an opportunity to see God move and shape us as a church and as individuals in a different way. I'm already into my message. Let me stop. Joshua chapter 5, starting at verse 13. If you have it, say amen. All right. I'm reading from the NIV this morning, three verses. That's, that's what we got this morning. That's the assignment. Here's what God has to say. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, 
he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day for nine years. Nine years, God, we've been able to assemble and come together and serve and learn and cry and frustrate each other, make each other angry, make up, work it out, watch you do some amazing things and leave us in awe. We've seen you perform miracles right before us. And so, God, we thank you today for all of it. Lord, most of all, we ask now that your word sink into our hearts and shape our heads and our minds and become active in our hands and in how we live. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Subject for today is a divine encounter, a divine encounter. When we enter here in this place in chapter 5, verse 13, the Israelites, the new generation, they've crossed over. They are now in striking distance of possessing the promised land that God had ordained for them and began to speak to them about through their ancestor Abraham over 500 plus years ago. It's interesting to me when I put this all together because I get sometimes antsy with God if I've got to wait five minutes, five days, five months. God has been saying this to their lineage for 500 years. And yet we know in it God desires to do something that only God can do. And so we see in the text now where Joshua has been faithful. He's been following everything that God has to say. And in following everything God has to say, he's moving forward with God's plan. And as he's pondering and contemplating what God would do next, there's a situation that arises. I like to call it, if you will, the confrontation. If you allow me just a few moments to take my time. The confrontation. In verse 13, it tells us that he was near Jericho. It seems to suggest he was by himself. Some seem to think he may have been out looking, reviewing, wondering, as well as possibly getting details about Jericho. Because after all, this is the closest they've ever been. It's the closest he's ever been. And in his mission, we see this scene. He's, he's able to look now and see this walled city. The history behind Jericho tells us it was a walled city. It was a mighty fortress, if you will. Very difficult to penetrate. And so... He could have been thinking, how is God going to move? How is God going to do this? How is God going to get us in, and not just get us in Jericho, but possess Jericho, take ownership of it? And so in this scene, while he's pondering and contemplating and having this moment, there then comes someone who steps onto the scene. And you have what I call this standoff. There's a man, it says, with a sword in his hand. Joshua is looking down, if you will, and then he looks up and he sees this man. And when he sees this man, Joshua doesn't back down. I think in my spiritual imagination, he was saying, we've come too far now to let a man <laughs> stand in between us and our promise. Have you ever gotten to that place in life where you, you're like, I'm finally on the right track. I'm finally on the right road. Things are finally lining up the way that I want them to. And I'm not going to let anybody, male or female, stand in my way for what God has for me. 
My imagination, I believe that's probably what Joshua was thinking. And so this man stands with a sword in his hand and Joshua didn't retreat. He didn't hit a reverse and go the opposite direction. Joshua comes head to head with this man. The Bible doesn't give this man at this point a name. He comes head to head with him and says, who are you, basically? And or are you for us or, or are you against us? Joshua said, there's no middle ground. You either on our team or you against our team. Joshua was bold. Joshua was in a zone that he was committed, that he was going to see this thing through. And so verse 14 tells us as he's looking and having this standoff and ask this man this question, let me read verse 14, his reply. He says, neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. I'll stop right there. <laughs> he said, I'm not on your side and I'm not against you. Rather, I am on divine assignment because I am a commander of the army of the Lord. Theologians have debated back and forth if this was one of three things, if it was a theophany, meaning this was God showing up in the earth realm, which we have precedence that he's done this before. When you look at the book of Genesis and take the story of Jacob wrestling to his hip is pulled out of socket. It, many believe that was a theophany. So it's not impossible because we serve the God of the impossible for him to show up in ways and at times when we least expect him. And yet, even with that, some have argued, well, that wasn't what this is because certain times Bible talks about in Daniel, for example, Michael the Archangel, he is the leader and commander of an army of hosts, meaning God's army of angels who defend and fight on behalf of the kingdom. And then some say this is pre coordinated Christ showing up to talk to Joshua, to show him, to put him at a place where he understands who's in charge. I tend to lean more to this being a theophany. However, no matter where you lean, here's what I want to say, and that is this. When God shows up, there's no need in us standing up because when God shows up in a way like this, he calls us to lay down and lay prostrate. Can I give you this first life point this morning on this beautiful church anniversary Sunday? God uses tension to get our attention so that we know who's in control. Can I say it another way? God uses tension to get our attention to remind us that he is in control. Joshua immediately in verse 14 tells us he, he lays prostrate. He, he bows down. He says, this who I've encountered, this is, this is of God. I can't buck against this. I don't want to. I want to get in position. Notice for getting in position to hear what God has to say, it required him to lay down. Can I tell somebody who's saying I cannot hear God? There seems to be a disconnect between me and heaven. Maybe the disconnect is not that heaven is shut off, but rather we're not in the proper position to hear what God is saying. Sometimes you got to lay down your phone. You got to lay down your TV remote. You got to lay down some relationships, lay down some people so that God can come in and speak to you in a way that only he can. Let me interject here. This is interesting for me because when I think about our church, I'll just be honest with you this morning. When God started talking about a church, I wasn't thinking about being no pastor. I just finished seminary. I was looking for what was next, but I was okay not being a pastor. And definitely when thinking about, well, I'm going to use my broken English and upset my English teacher, Mr. McKenzie, I wasn't thinking about being nobody's pastor or planting no churches. If anything, God, you will call me call my family to something that's existing in your time and in your season. And in my mind, that season was years from now. Yeah, I know some of y'all are probably laughing at the screen, but I'm just telling you the truth this Sunday morning. This wasn't on the radar. And then God showed up and began to speak and talk about organizing and planning a church. And some of you may know this and some of you may not. Even in the midst of all that, there were churches that 
we would visit, and some of them I were preaching, and one in particular, I won't call the church's name, but they came together, and they made a phone call to me on one Tuesday evening, right after submitting the paperwork to the state of Missouri to officially incorporate as a church in January of 2012. I'll never forget this. They called and said, we heard that you were on a mission with a small group of people to organize a church. We wanted you to know that we have just come together in our search committee and we took a vote and it was unanimous. We want you to be our pastor. Now, here I am. It wasn't really much of a crossroads, to be honest, because I knew that this is what was supposed to be. So I shared that with them and they were gracious and they, they prayed with me and said, if something changes, let us know. Now, in my mind, all of this is still somewhat moving rapidly for me because in my mind, I'm going, how is it that we are here now doing this? I want this. You see this picture coming up. This is where it all started in the basement of our home, working with a group and a family, learning what it is to trust one another. My wife had walked us through this series of training to be ready to work as a team because that's our expertise. That's what she does. She's wired that way. And you see in the picture, that's what we're doing. We're in the office of my own home. And never did I imagine from the office in our own home to being in urban K life, to being at 3801 Ashland, to soon being at 3000 Prairie. But all I'm trying to say to you is all of that has happened and come to pass because God had a confrontation with me and he laid me down and said, this is what I want for you. And because this is what I want, you move it forward, I'll do my part, you do your part. I want to talk to somebody this morning who's wrestling with something. God is having a confrontation with you, a godly confrontation, and you're trying to discover if you can work your way out of that thing. Take it from your pastor, or if you're a guest, take it from me this morning. You cannot maneuver out of the ministry and the mission God has on your life. And so here Joshua is. He's confronted with God himself. God says, here is what I want you to do. And here is how I want you to handle it. And it comes from the commander. Let's, let's talk about that for a moment. We talked about the confrontation. Let's talk about the commander here, the commander here. I, I just want to talk to you this morning through this message and, and pour some things into you. The, the commander, the commander, as we so far have laid out, I believe was God. He shows up what seems like out of nowhere possibly to Joshua, but according to God's schedule, it was right on time. Keep in mind that the Israelites, the men are healing from circumcision, and they're sitting at the brink of the promise. Joshua is now away because sometimes you got to get away so that God can show up. I'll deal with that on another Sunday. However, I do want to put in the air that sometimes we're too close and too connected to things and to people to even be able to hear the commander. And so the commander has to get us away. So Joshua is away from the noise and the chatter and the distractions. And as he's away, the commander shows up. Sometimes God waits till we get in a secluded place so that he can show up and speak to us in ways that resonate with us as individuals. Here it is, the commander. The commander, you notice, the commander takes charge. The commander says, neither. I'm not on your side or, or anybody's side. I am the commander of the Lord's army. He was letting Joshua know that there is a battle that lies ahead, and my team, who I lead, will lead this battle. And if you follow my lead and do what I'm asking of you, then you will be victorious and possess all that God has promised you and your native Israelites. He takes charge. Can I tell you, you think that people hate you, don't like you, can't stand you. It's not you that they can't stand or don't like or hate on. It's what God is doing. But please remember, the battle is not yours. You don't have to fight people. You don't have to fight 
uh, certain ideas and perceptions. All you and I have to do is follow God's plan. And when we follow his plan, God shows up and fights our battles. That's why Paul said, doing all we can to stand. Stand, therefore, with the whole armor of God. Our fight is just to stand. God does the actual battle. Our fight is just to keep the sword in our hand and use it when necessary, which is the word of God. That's why when the enemy comes upon us, it's best for us to speak to him what he already knows, which defeats him, which is God's word. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. If God be for us, then who can be against us? David I love, he says, I was young and now I'm old, but I've never, you never, not sometimes, not on occasion. He says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Does that mean that there haven't been some low moments, some times that he had to go without? Yes, he did. But even when he went physically without, he said, God never forsake me. He never left me. He was always present and provided what I need. And I discovered what I thought I needed. I didn't need it, but what I needed, he gave me. I'm talking to somebody watching this morning that the commander wants to show up in your life and show you what he's capable of when you get in a position to allow him to take charge. Here's the other thing about the commander. The commander is totally committed. The commander shows up on his own free will. God is sovereign. He just shows up because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. All of it belongs to him. He just shows up because he's totally committed. God is committed to everything that he says in his word. That's why he told Joshua in chapter one, if you want to be successful, meditate on the word. And if you meditate on the word and follow the law, meaning the directions of God, then you will be successful because God is committed. That's why the commander says, I'm not on anybody's side. I don't have to take sides because I am God. I don't take sides. I create sides. <laughs> I don't have to line up with what you want because I create what I want, the way I want it, when I want it, how I want it. Can I give you life point number two? Catch this. God does not come to champion our causes. He comes to be commander in chief of our lives. Let me say that again, because sometimes we think that God's uh, day or his mission is about getting on our page. No, God does not come to champion our causes. He comes to show us that he is commander in chief of our lives. The commander shows up so that Joshua would not get the big head and that he would be reminded that it was him who was in control. Brings me to something. Makes me think about in the lifeline of our church. There was a, a time where look things over in this building it didn't look like it did today. And in the eyes of many, it didn't make sense to buy a building, let alone a building you need to renovate. It's only at this point, it's 17, 18 of you all. Why would you do that? That doesn't make sense. Church we bought it from said, why are you putting all that money into that? Pastors that I knew would say, why? And then a few would encourage. Here's the thing that gets me about it. One day I was here and we were working on this building and some things came out that we didn't see at first and it added more cost. And I was sitting in this very sanctuary complaining, going, God, we, we could just stay down the street. And, you know, God, we, you know, I thought you was in this. And I was then in that moment humbly reminded. It was as if God poked me on my side and said to me, son, I never said I was on your side or the church's side. I am God. I have a mission for you all. And you're here to fulfill that mission. And when you stay on the page of my mission, then everything will fall into his place. It was a humble rebuke and a 
and a definite reminder of that when God calls someone and some group and some congregation and some church to something, he has the ability to follow through so long as we understand that it's not about him championing our cause. Yes, there are times where God steps in beside us in tragedy as well as triumph and when we're hurting and he helps us, but understand God's overarching demeanor is that he doesn't take our side, he calls us to be on his side. And I can tell you as God has called us to be on his side. God has provided in ways and through resources and because he's the source and opened up doors that others look at and stand in amazement of our church and go, how did your church do that? How do you guys do that? How do you serve? They, they think it's easy. It's not all easy. They think it's all nice and sweet. No, we've had some tough moments, moments some tumultuous moments. I'm going to be honest, some moments where Things clashed so bad that it made me pray, is this still going to hold together? And yet, God seemingly, we've held it together. Not only held it together, caused it to thrive. There was some who walked away and said, this would never work, it would never be. And yet, God allows it to not just be, but to thrive. Because when we understand that God is at the center, and that God is calling us to be on his side, we can see God do some amazing things. So we've seen this confrontation. We see the commandment. Let me talk about this last thing. Got a few minutes, and then really, I'm out of your way. I want to talk about the commission. Joshua says at the end of verse 14, what message do you have? Because he understood God wasn't just showing up. That God was showing up to speak. He was willing to not only hear, but to listen. Verse 15, let me read to you again. It says, the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. <laughs> he gives this directive. We see here the commission. See God commissioning Joshua. It mirrors what he did in Moses' life. And talked a few weeks ago about it's okay to be in the shadow of your successor because that doesn't mean that God won't do a new thing and isn't doing a new thing. It simply builds credibility. If you remember in chapter 3, God said to Joshua in verse 7, today I will begin to exalt you as a great leader in the eyes of Israel. All of these things are done so that they would know that God was with him, that Joshua was God's man. So he gives him this directive, take off your shoes, meaning become a, come to him with respect and honor and awe. That's our worship. Can I tell you, God, even in our homes over the past year, God has sustained us as a church where, unfortunately, my heart bleeds and cries out because some churches have had to close permanently or merge with another church because of the devastation of not being able to meet together and what it has done to them and how they do ministry and how um, they have enough revenue to function as a church, it breaks my heart that some have had to make that decision. And God decided to keep his hand on us, Tabernacle, and allow us to be sustained over a year. And here's what God has done. You see this number come up on the screen. God calls 2020 to be the, the, the biggest. It, it, it ties me up. It tongue twists me. He allowed 2020 to be the year where we gave the most as a church as well as some outside sources who support us. For the first time, we got above $100,000 in contributions. That may not seem like a big deal to you, many, but let me tell you, because of the life of our church and our heartbeat and who we desire to serve and who we want to reach, not just people outside the neighborhood, but our targeted focus of trying to reach as many people for Jesus right here in 63107, 63106, 63115. You'll see this in our annual report, but let me just put it up here. It's on the screen. God allowed us to raise through our generosity, through us trusting God, $106,000 last year, highest ever in the life of our church, in the midst of a pandemic. 
We exemplify one of our core values, which is generosity. We also exemplified another core value, which is intentionality. We were intentional about still giving and trusting and believing God. And here's what God did with that. He allowed us to begin, which we have laying the framework for our online campus. He allowed us to then create two channels, the Amazon Fire Stick channel and the Roku channel, so that we could reach people who are not on social media, as well as give another means for people to connect and keep in touch not only with the church, but with God's word, and they could view it at any time. Let, let me tell you what else that has done. It allowed us to have the, the technical equipment to do it and the technical personnel to, to make it happen. And as a result of that, now people view us from the state of Texas, the state of Georgia, the state of Florida, as well as here in St. Louis. I never would have thought that this church that started with Four families, eight adults, eight kids, would have people connecting it and calling their church home that live in Texas, Georgia, and Florida. But that's God. God says, when you worship me, when you serve me faithfully, it ain't about stuff. It ain't about numerics. However, in the numerics, we've seen God work. Joshua, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. God says, this is consecrated. The ground, the dirt. It's not special. It's the fact that God has showed up and he's present. And can I tell you, through, through our moments of getting it wrong, through our moments of not being obedient always, and our moments of trying to figure it out, God has continued to push us and propel us forward as a church that we can honestly say that now. And as we think about strategy and moving forward and opening our doors back up, we have to consider and we will stay a hybrid church because now we do. We have people in those three states and I just believe God will have more watching, not for the sake so we can boast and brag, for the sake of advancing his kingdom. Check this out. Check this out. He, he, he's allowed us to cover over $100,000 in expenses that way to make all of this happen through the generosity of us. I'm holding up something. Can I tell you, we're still functioning from this. This is called Tab 2020 Plan. Bloom where you are planted. In this has been our strategic roadmap and our guide based off of Jeremiah 29 where God says, seek the welfare of the city, for when you seek its welfare, you will find yours. As we continue to seek and allow God to lead us to serve right here, we find our peace and wholeness and shalom as we seek and desire and pray for that in our city. Now, we've still got a whole lot more work to do. Homicides are up. Homelessness is up. We've got a waiting list of people trying to get safe, secure, affordable housing. And yet God is blessing us to be engaged in that. And when they see us as God's people engaged in that, it gives the door and the platform for evangelism and reaching people. The way to evangelize is just do what God has called us to do. In this, God said, have gospel impact. Jeremiah spoke about that. Build, marry, plant. He says that godly transformation. He says, I still got a plan for your life. Israel, even though you've blown it and you sinned and you've fallen short, I still got a plan. You can still take off your shoes because this is still holy ground. Huh. Here's our neighborhood, Jeff Vandaloo primarily, where average income is $23,500 a year. Yet business income, people profiting off the neighborhood is near $24 million. And in that, God is calling us to help people build economically so that it can empower them to live a safe, sustainable life. You talk about discipleship one-on-one -on -one when we can help people get housed and then get the health care they need and the right food to improve their health conditions and then help children thrive in their schools. Now, all of a sudden, you're seeing God move in a different way. We don't do this to get people to join church. And yet, as a result of it, many have come to Christ and come to know God and come a part of this church, not because of us being special, but because we've decided to take off our shoes and understand that God is still at work, that he's given this directive and designated it right here. Let me talk to you for a little bit about 
Tabernacle Community Development Corporation established in 2014 Extension Ministry of the Church. Separate board, separate 5013C status. Last year, highest in revenue in its existence of seven years, right at $765,000 in revenue used to serve people, to help people who lost housing, get temporary housing, and then on the permanent housing, help to feed people, help to keep people's utilities on in the midst of a pandemic, and have jobs for our construction teams to continue renovating leading us and pushing us in the year of 2020, climbing to the place where we are close to $5.5 million over the last seven years. We have invested right here. And I believe there's more that God wants us to invest. Through Tabernacle CDC, we serve 34 families currently, which equates to over 100 individuals. That's adults and children. In that 34 families that we serve, the majority of them were on the brink and on the margin, and God has allowed us to step into their lives. In addition to that, over the course of this time frame, renovate 13 homes, create a total of 96 construction jobs, run about an 80% minority participation rate. And here's the part that gets me the most, is that even now, just this past week, a lady walked up to me and then stopped in six feet with her mask on and said, listen, I know y'all purchased this particular house. She said, when it's done, is it possible I can live there? I just want to live somewhere safe. <laughs> as much as the world thinks oftentimes that people want something extravagant or more than what they deserve, no, they, they know that they're made in the image of God and that God wants better for them, and God allows us through these mediums to be a part of that better. And it only happens when we reverence and understand that we have been commissioned and called to this work. And so, as I close, I want to leave you with two points. First one being this life point right here. Our strategy, you know, most times we God, what's the strategy? What should I be doing? Our strategies as individuals and as a church, our strategy is to be in submission and surrender to God, period. That's, that should be our strategy. Joshua lays prostrate. God, speak to me. Talk to me. Tell me what it is you would have. God gives them directives. Take off your shoes. This is holy ground. This is the place where you worship me. This is the place where you're in awe of me. I know for some that's hard because you say, you know, I don't take all of that when I come to church. Let me share with you something. When God is present, his, his aura is sovereign. It takes over. It should make us want to throw our hands in worship, whether we're sitting here in person or at home behind a screen. There ought to be something about when certain things are said from the scriptures that stir something up and cause us to want to throw our hands up and to worship him because God has been too good to us as individuals. And let me tell you, God has been way too good to us as a church to sit and be quiet. J.B. Phillips said this in his book, Your God is Too Small. He speaks about the boxes we put God in, whether they're denominational or personal preference. And in the essence of one chapter and one few pages of the book, he lets it be known that people who are outside of the church don't have a problem with preference. It's when we try and make our preferences above what God's plan is. I want to suggest to you today in this divine encounter, Joshua gets a full understanding that his preferences don't come before God because God is in charge and God is too large to be fit into our personal preferences and boxes. May we take God out of the box going into this next year. As we roll out over time details about how we will serve in different ways we will engage, may we take God out of the box. May we allow the commission that he's given us to reach as many people for Jesus Christ and to advance his kingdom take over for us. Why? Because God has been everything to us and he's still calling us deeper into this mission. So here's what I want to do. I want to pray. And then we're going to enter back into worship. Oh God, how we love you. Because you're worthy of our love. 
And let me say this, if you're watching this morning and you don't have a church home or you're trying to, you're still working through who is Jesus, please join us in Tab Cafe after this. Or just drop us a line in, in the chat and we'll connect with you. Because we believe God is not done calling people into this story and into this work. And maybe, just maybe, God wants to do something in your life. In fact, we know he does. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We honor you today. What a blessing it is to celebrate. And yet, no, we've been commissioned and called. Thank you for giving us a divine encounter with you. For making this not only happen, but leave us in awe. And to do things only, God, that you could do. I ask now, Lord, that as we prepare and get ready to, to worship, that you open our hearts to just receive you. Oh, Lord, how we love you. And may that love come across by our actions today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Take care. Worship with us. Praise and glorify you. You.